here today, a lot of guests and visitors, and uh, this is such a special day. It's uh, Sunday and the Lord's Day, and it's Christmas, December 25th, and we have three baptisms, so I can't think of any greater gift than that today. I'm so grateful to Sandy and Tracy for leading us, and Sandy set up all this beautiful uh, stage, and uh, I just am so grateful for uh, everyone who volunteered for this. Uh, this morning we're going to do a baptism, and uh, the reason why, why do you have baptism? And it comes from Jesus, the last command, before Jesus ascended into heaven in Matthew 28, 18, 19, and 20. He gave this command to all of his disciples. He said, all power and authority is given to me in heaven and in earth. Therefore, go into all the world and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And I will be with you until the very end of the age. And so that's why when people receive Christ as Savior and Lord, we want them to follow in obedience uh, to Jesus' command and follow Him in baptism. The reason that we immerse in this big tank of water is because of Romans chapter 6, where Paul described the meaning of baptism. Baptism is a picture, it's a testimony that these, these three people want to make to you, that they have received Jesus Christ as their Savior and Lord. And then Romans chapter 6 says, as we are baptized, we are buried with Jesus Christ in His baptism, and then we are risen with Jesus to walk in a new life. And so that's why we have uh, this ceremony. So it's exciting, it's, it's these testimony of these that have come to receive Christ and I hope that as you watch this testimony, if you've never received Jesus as your Savior and Lord, I pray that today you will do that. And if you've never been baptized, I hope you'll talk to me. Uh, I'd like to get with you. These, these, All three of these have been through a baptism class so that they understand this. And we would welcome you to, to come through this same testimony. So now I'm going to have Brian and Diane Wilson to come. Very carefully. <laughs> The real answer to prayer today is we have warm water. <laughs> <laughs> this is Brian and Diane Wilson. They've come to receive Jesus as Savior and Lord, so we're going to baptize them. Brother Brian, if you'll come over here. here. Brian, have you received Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord? Yes. Then upon your profession of faith in Jesus as Savior and Lord, and in obedience to His command, I baptize you, my brother, Father, in the name of the Son, Jesus Christ, and in the name of the Holy Spirit. Buried with Him in baptism, <coughs> risen to walk in newness of life. And you baptized in Christ. <laughs> this is my sister Diane Wilson. Diane, have you received Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord? Then yes. upon your profession of faith in Jesus as your Savior and Lord, and in obedience to his command, I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, Jesus Christ, and of the Holy Spirit. Buried with him in baptism, risen to walk in newness of life. Buried with him in baptism. 
risen to walk in newness of life. Advent reading for the holiday season. And I just want to say that it's amazing that we have baptism on this day and church on a Sunday on Christmas. <coughs> That's amazing. I've never experienced this in my life. So I'm just happy to be here with my family. Luke 12, 33 through 34. Sell your possessions and give to the poor. Provide purses for yourselves that will not wear out. A treasure in heaven that will never fail, where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Matthew 6, 19 through 21. Do not store up for yourselves treasure on earth, where moths and vermin do destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moths and vermin do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. James 1.17 Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. 2 Corinthians 9.7 9, Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. We know that tis the season for giving, but these verses highlight what a giving spirit really means. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will, will be put into your lap, for with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. Families, especially children, may be eager to unwrap presents and to get, get, get. But these Advent readings can remind us how God did nothing but give when he sent Jesus to earth. Let's have a prayer. Jesus, it's oh so easy to forget the true meaning of the Bible. That you gave, you gave your life so that we could have life abundant. May we not get lost in the consumerism and greed that often accompanies this season. Give us a spirit of compassion and charity so we, that we may bless others this time of the year and throughout the year, not just in December. Amen. 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 Now we invite you just to sing more songs of praise to our, our incarnate and now risen Lord. You're welcome to stand or sit, but we ask you to raise your voice with us this morning. Come on, Miss Jeannie, I know you'll say that. Yes, and we're so glad you're sorry, Dad. We miss Jeannie.
has been lost for some time. Uh, we have Santa Claus and Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, and we have uh, Frosty the Snowman, and we have all these stories and books and uh, movies on TV about Christmas, the presents, the shopping, uh, thank the Lord for gift cards. Man, aren't you thankful for gift cards? <laughs> and, uh, and it just all gets lost together. I think it, it came together for me uh, when I, we saw recently a nativity scene set up, all lit up, and there was Mary and Joseph and the wise men and the shepherds and the sheep and Santa Claus kneeling at the manger. And I thought, okay, we're, we're putting everything together here now. If you have that, that's fine. I just uh, the the meaning of Christmas is gone for our uh, secular world, our American society. And so, for a few minutes today, I just want to walk through the Christmas story one more time and look at at what this is all about. What is Christmas all about? Um, where does it come from? What's the meaning of it? And if you can take your scripture, there are Bibles in the chairs there, or maybe your cell phone, <clears throat> wherever you have scripture, and turn to Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2. Uh, here at Bell Road Baptist Church, for the last several weeks, we've walked through Luke chapter 1, which is the preparation for the coming of the Messiah. And we looked at Zechariah, who's, who uh, the announcement was made to him first. John the Baptist would be coming, his son. And then the announcement to Mary, and then uh, the birth of John the Baptist, and all of this is in preparation for the coming of Jesus Christ. And so now today, uh, we come to Luke chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. Uh, this is the New International Version. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to his own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. And while they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. And she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in clothes and placed him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord, and this will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in clothes and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. And so they hurried off, and they found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. And when they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this wonderful story of the birth of Jesus Christ in Bethlehem on this very special day. We read these words and believe that your Holy Spirit now will teach us the true meaning of these words. We bring to you this morning an open heart, a contrite heart. We ask you to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us and prepare us to receive this Christ into our hearts today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. There are several things about this story that I, I want to point out uh, as we walk through this story. 
The first thing I want you to know and understand is that this story in Luke chapter 2 is a truth story. There are so many Christmas stories about Santa Claus and Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer and Frosty the Snowman. And they're fun and we like that and lots of singing and songs. But the fact is that this one story in Luke chapter 2 is a historical event. Uh, Luke made very careful. He, he said, in those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree. That's a historical fact by other Roman writers that a, a, a census should be taken through the entire Roman world. That's well documented in Roman and Latin literature. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. That's a true fact. And there are other uh, writers during that time that wrote about Quirinius and the time that he served. And so everyone went to their town. And here's Joseph. He went from the town of Nazareth in Galilee down to Bethlehem, the town of David. Those are real cities and they still exist today. And so I want you to know that when you hear about Jesus and you see the beautiful nativity scenes and we sing these beautiful hymns, it's, it's true. This is a true account of the birth of Jesus Christ. The story actually happened. And what that means for us this morning is we are confronted with the truth, a fact of God coming into the world through Jesus Christ to redeem us from our sins. We are each faced with that truth. We think of Santa Claus and it's fun and Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer and Frosty the Snowman. And they're fun, they're delightful, they make us smile. But this is life-changing. This account, this story, it really happened. And because it happened in history, we are confronted with a decision that we have to make. And the second thing I want to point out in, in this story is that it is good news. Everything about the true story of Christmas is all good news. Um, it's good news because it's based on the unique person of this child. There has never been born in history a child like this child in, on Christmas, in Bethlehem, in the manger. Jesus was absolutely unique. Earlier in Luke chapter 1, Gabriel came and gave the announcement to Mary that she was going to be a mother. She was going to be the one to give birth to Jesus. And in Luke 1, 29, it says, Mary was greatly troubled at his words. She was single. She was a virgin. She was young. She was engaged to be married, but she had had no relationships. And so she asked, uh, the, the angel says to Mary, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. You have found favor with God. You'll conceive and give birth to a son and call him Jesus. Call him Jesus. He will be great and be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord will give him the throne of his father, David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never be. And so in that announcement, we find how unique Jesus is. His name should have been named <coughs> Joseph. He should have been the son of the carpenter from Nazareth, but he was not. This child that was born on Christmas Day was called the Son of God, the Son of the Most High. This child that was born in such poverty and meanness and simplicity was given the kingdom of King David. He was given the kingdom of Israel to reign over Israel for all eternity. No other child had ever been born to that. And he was going to be called the Son of God. The Son of God. When the angel gives that uh, announcement to the shepherds, uh, to the shepherds, uh, he says in verse 11 of our text, Jesus, uh, he says, is the Savior who is Christ the Lord. Three words. Savior, Christ, and Lord. Savior from what? Why is Jesus called Savior? 
because he is to save us from our sins and give us a new life. Christ, why is he called Christ? That word means Messiah, the anointed one. And for hundreds of years, God had prophesied through his prophets that he would send a Messiah, a Savior, to save and redeem the people of Israel and all the world. And now, 400 years after the last prophecy of Malachi, that he would be born in Bethlehem. 400 years they've waited, and now this child, this unique child, has been born. And so what we see here in, the, in these words, Savior and Christ and Lord, is that Jesus Christ is fully human. That's so important. He wasn't born a ghost or a spirit or something in the air. He was born a real live baby. A human being. Now Philippians chapter 2 is so helpful. Philippians chapter 2 verse 5. Uh, Paul says, have the mindset of Christ Jesus. Listen, verse 6, Philippians 2, 6. Jesus, who being in very nature God. Who being in very nature God. Did not consider equality with God. Something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made, Jesus made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. Human likeness. And being found in the appearance of a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even the death on the cross. The uniqueness of this child in this manger is that this is God himself, emptying all of his divinity and taking on the form of humanity so that he could grow up 30 years in Galilee and then he could be teach and he could be crucified on the cross for our sins. He's the only sacrifice for our sins. Be buried and then risen in a new life, victorious, so that you and I no longer have to be afraid of anything. We can put our trust in him and receive him. He is fully man. But he's also fully God. Okay, can you explain that, Pastor? No, I cannot explain that. But I believe it. I accept it by faith because God's word <coughs> says that. He's fully God. He is the Messiah. He is Christ the Lord. Colossians chapter 2, Colossians chapter 2 verse 9 has been so helpful uh, to me. The whole chapter, Colossians chapter 2, is about the sovereignty of Jesus Christ, his deity. But in verse 9, uh, Paul writes, For in Jesus Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. I don't have an explanation, but I believe that because scripture is true. All the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. And in Christ, you have been brought to fullness. Jesus is the head over every power and authority. And so that's the, the third thing we see here, is that Jesus is the Christ. He is this Messiah, the promised one for hundreds and hundreds of years in the Old Testament. Everything in the Old Testament points to that birth of Jesus Christ in Bethlehem and his life and his death. Uh, again, the, the shepherds were there and the, the angels said, Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He's Messiah, the Lord. This word Messiah uh, is, is the word Christ. Messiah is the Old Testament word. Christ is the New Testament word. And it means the anointed one, the chosen one. Jesus is absolutely unique in, in every aspect. And that's why we worship him today. And then that last word that they used was the word Savior. Savior, absolutely unique. No other child born has ever been introduced to the world as your Savior. He has come to save us from our sins. That's why in Acts chapter 4 verse 8, Peter in his first sermon makes 
that makes the strongest statement in the New Testament. And it's the, it's the verse that today is so challenging in our American society. Now listen to what Peter says in Acts chapter 4, verse 8. He's filled with the Holy Spirit. And then he says, Know this, all the people, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. Jesus is the stone you builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone. Acts 4.12. Acts 4.12. Salvation is found in no other. No one else. For there is no other name under heaven given to mankind whereby we must be saved. That is so un-American. That is so un-American today. We are a society of acceptance. We are a society that accepts everyone, whether you believe or you don't believe, or whatever religion you believe, or whatever is true. The most important thing in American society is that you be happy, that you find happiness in this life by whatever path or by whatever road. And so we as Christians, who have accepted Jesus Christ as our Savior and Lord, have stepped outside of that belief. And we've said, for us, we believe that Jesus is absolutely unique. And we want to receive Him and Him alone as Savior and Lord. And that's why we send out, we support through our Baptist Church, 3,000 missionaries. And they are around the world this morning, sharing the gospel and planting churches. That's why we gather here at Bell Road Baptist Church every Sunday to worship Jesus Christ as our Savior and Lord. And there's a third thing here that I want to get to, and that is the good news. The good news is that Jesus Christ, the Savior, the Messiah, is for all people. All people. I love this story in Luke 2. It doesn't say, and there were gathered all the priests and the prophets and the pastors and teachers of the law and they were taking care of their law books and scripture and the angel appeared to them. No. And it doesn't say, and at that time, the king and the governors and the politicians were all gathered and they were looking over their laws and the angel appeared to them and told them the good news. No. No, it specifically says there were shepherds. The lowest the lowest job available at that time in Bethlehem. Out on the hills, tending their sheep. And the angel of the Lord appeared to them with this great announcement. Not the religious leaders, not the government leaders, not the wealthy in their homes. The shepherds. I like 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26. I don't understand it, but I love it. Listen to 1 Corinthians 1, 26. Paul says, brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many of you were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose, God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose, God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are. It is because of Him, it is because of Jesus that you're in Jesus Christ who has become for us the wisdom from God. He is our righteousness, our holiness, and our redemption. And so as we come and gather here, we don't, we don't come to Bell Road because God looked down and saw something so special in us and called us to himself. I hate to tell our church members this, but actually God shows us because we're the least, <laughs> the least in this world, so that Jesus could be everything to us. Those that were baptized today, you've testified that you've died to your old self. You buried that with Jesus. And you're risen to walk in a new life. And that life is Jesus Christ. The child that was born on Christmas Day. 
So this, this good news brings light and joy. We live in a world of darkness. Our American society is a world of darkness and fear and worry. People worry about, about the refugee problem on the border, and they worry about gas prices, and they worry about the change of government, and they worry and they're afraid of what, 2023, what's going to happen? Things are just going to get worse. I've heard that over and over. It's just going to get worse and worse. Our, our world is in darkness. But because of the birth of Jesus Christ, it's light. Listen to what the shepherds saw in Luke 2. They were living out in the fields, keeping watch at night. The shepherds were in darkness. And the angel appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them. Can you imagine the light that came to them in that dark place, cold, out there at night? And the whole sky lit up with the angelic hosts. And they came around them and, and shared this good news with them. We had Mary's uh, that response then. What were the shepherds going to do? And that's the closing here today in this uh, passage. Because Jesus was born in Bethlehem, and because he is fully God and fully man, and because Jesus died on the cross for your sins and for my sins, and he wants to restore us to a relationship with God, because this is true, we have to make a response. That's the last thing. We have to respond to this Christmas story. Mary's response is in Luke chapter 1, verse 38, earlier. She said, I am the Lord's servant. May your word to me be fulfilled. We have Joseph's response in Matthew chapter 1. The angel came to Joseph and told him about this birth and what was happening to Mary and explained it to him. And his response was, uh, Matthew 1, 24, when Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him to do. And we have the shepherd's response. The angel said to him, Go and find this babe who is Christ the Lord. And their response is in Luke chapter 2, Let's go! I love that verse. Let's go! Let's go and to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened. And so they hurried off. They hurried off and found Mary and Joseph. And then in verse 17, they spread the news. They didn't keep it to themselves. They spread the news uh, uh, concerning what had been told them. And then when they returned, after all of that, they, they were filled and they glorified God and praised God. So as we close this special Christmas service and the hymns <coughs> and the baptisms and all that's been done, the, the last question this morning is, what is your response to Jesus Christ? What is your response? Can you turn and, and walk away, just shake your head? And that's very interesting. I wonder what it all means. Or can you come as these three have come and as the other members of our church have come and, and millions around the world and receive this, this baby that was born in a manger in Bethlehem? And grew up and taught us how to be like God. And died on the cross for our sins. And was buried for three days. And then arose victorious over death. Can you receive that Jesus? And place your faith and trust in Him as your Savior. But then live for Him as Lord. Do not be afraid. The angel said to Joseph. The angel said to Zechariah. The angel said to Elizabeth. The angel said to Mary, the angel said to the shepherds, do not be afraid. Can you live a life like that and receive Jesus as Savior and Lord? Let's stand together for a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for this amazing story from Luke chapter 2. We thank you for this wonderful day, Christmas Day. We thank you for the real meaning of Christmas, the good news of Jesus Christ. I thank you for these three that came uh, today to follow you in believer's baptism and obey your command and give this great testimony. And I pray for every person here this morning, Father, whatever their need is for you. If they receive Jesus but still want to be baptized, 
Help them to find that way. If, if they've never thought about accepting you, Jesus as Savior and Lord, I pray that your spirit would move in their heart. Now we give you praise and honor and glory for this wonderful day. And we leave this place with joy in our hearts that Jesus has been born. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.